Welcome back to House on Carrion Hill, House of Bob's cosmic horror adventure played in Pathfinder 2nd Edition in the Galarian campaign setting. Hi, I'm Dan. I'm playing Willen Dappen, the gnome wizard. Hi, I'm Jeanette. I'm playing Bimkin, the long snout rat oracle. Hey, I'm Schubert. I am playing Nib Nub, the razor tooth goblin fighter. I'm Trevor, and I'll be playing Theobald, the orc investigator. And I'm Sean, your game master. If you like what we do and you want to support the show, visit us at patreon.com slash the house of Bob. Last time on House of Carrion Hill, after Bimkin experiences a frightening dream, he joins Tom and the boys to investigate another attack by the wolf. Putting their heads together and using a number of investigatory tools at their disposal, the group believes they are on the trail of the killer. And then, suddenly, something totally different happens. So the four of you currently stand in an intersection in carrying a hill in the tangles, the sort of mid-level area of the city, standing all around a manhole cover where Bimkin and Theobald have used their senses of smell. Theobald alchemically gifted and Bimkin, you know, just because he's a rat. You have tracked the smell of a really bad B.O. slash formaldehyde sort of scent through the alleys, through the streets, basically to this point. And just as you're about to lift the manhole cover or to investigate further, you hear this explosion in the distance. The dust flies up into the air on the next street. There's a collapsing sound, lots of screaming. And as you look up in that direction, you see people beginning to run madly away from this dust cloud. Oh my God, guys. Well, are we just going to stand here? What should I bite? Something in the cloud. Are people running in one direction or are they just running everywhere? They are running away from this big dust cloud that you see pluming up uh, about two streets over. All right, I'm going to rush into the cloud. I think I will rush away from the cloud. Bimkin runs away from the cloud. Willen runs towards the cloud. Nibnub will join Willen. Okay. All right, well, then I feel like if we're splitting the party, we should do it evenly, so... <laughs> <laughs> All right. I guess we know who the true heroes are. <laughs> <laughs> or the true idiots, I guess we'll see. <laughs> yeah. All right. This is the last thing I expected. <laughs> <laughs> the pair of adventurers that are running towards the dust cloud need to somehow squeeze their way through the crowd. How are you going to do that? I'm going to yell at everybody to get out of my freaking way. And I have a stabby stick that I'm poking. All right, make an Intimidate. 14 Intimidate. Okay. You find it quite difficult to make progress as people are just too panicked to even pay attention to you. They're currently pushing and shoving and knocking you back and you're making very little headway. Willen, how are you making your way through? I did some sweet acrobatics and I did them really well. I rolled a 20 and I had plus nine, so... 29 acrobatics, so instead of going underneath people, I decided to go above them, and I just, like, leap into the air and start doing that, like, shoulder running thing where you're running along everyone's shoulders. Ride them like a border collie, riding sheep. <laughs> yeah, it's just a wave of people that I'm running on top of. All right, so Willen pulls an Aladdin, running shoulder to shoulder across these panicked people, using his staff for balance and his colorful boots flash across the shoulders of this press of uh, peasants, and you come through into the next street where you see running past two town guards caught on the heels of Commander Garrus, who you remember seeing the other day. Mm -hmm. They are full on sprinting towards the cloud. And just as you manage to clear the crowd of people, you see all three guards disappear into the cloud, totally obscured by this mound of dust. And then there's a second explosion of rubble out from within the cloud as these boulders and rocks just flash out, slamming into adjacent buildings and you can see there's a man hobbling against the next building. 
He's been struck by some of the debris. You see blood coming from his forehead. He's hobbling on a, a wounded leg, struggling to pull himself along the building. You can see his face is just distraught with uh, uh, fear and pain. Oh, oh no. Uh, Nibnub, you, you get in the fray. I'm going to go heal this guy. You turn around, you see Nibnub is nowhere to be seen. He wasn't able to make through the crowd yet. Oh my God. It's just me. <laughs> the hero. <laughs> <laughs> It's up to you. Yeah, I run up to the injured man. And I'm, first, I'm just going to do a med- medicine check. Okay. See how, see how bad he is. Okay, I got a 22. Okay, so you can see that his wounds are fairly superficial, but they're definitely going to slow him down. He's got a busted knee. Maybe his ACL is torn. And this cut on his forehead, while it's gushing a lot of blood, it does look like it's just superficial cut to the scalp. It's not any serious head wound or anything like that, so... If you're able to help him out of here, he might make it quite well. Okay. I will attempt to help him leave then. No, I'll right. uh, get underneath him and be like his third leg or whatever. All right. Third leg is an athletics check. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what'd you roll? I rolled a three. Oh, oh no. Boy. <laughs> All right. So you are struggling to help this guy, but you're just too small. You're like two and a half feet tall or something like that. Yeah. And you're like put his arm over your shoulder and he's still, you know, four feet above you, basically. And you're struggling to pull him down the street. When you see finally coming through the crowd is Nip Nub with his pitchfork. All right. I say to the guy, like, "Uh, you find your own way. (laughs) I'm only making it worse. (laughs) And then I, I give him a gentle shove in the right direction. No, wait, don't leave me. There's some sort of crazy monster or something. You've got to get me out of here, please. I can't. Well, run the other way. I'm trying to run away. And my leg well, is too hurt. Well. Maybe this, <laughs> that's gone. <laughs> Don't you have some magic? <laughs> please, you look like a, a hero. You're an adventurer. But spell, spell slots. You gotta help me out. (laughs) 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 You're the worst town wizard ever. (laughs) Unfortunately, I don't think I prepped any healing spells today. I don't think you're a wizard. You don't have any healing spells. You just have to find a way to get him out of there. I thought I had a healing spell. I thought I had one. Can't you, like, make yourself stronger and then just beast mode this guy out of here? Okay, here's, here's what I'll do for you. All right, man, just hold still. And then I cast invisibility on him. All right, so he vanishes in front of your eyes. Nibnub, this guy that Willen is standing in front of, just disappears. Oh, my God. And you hear him go, my hands, my hands. I can't see my hands. What's going on? <laughs> You're invisible, you idiot. <laughs> Run. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> and you hear some scrabbling and scraping as it sounds like he is beginning to make his way away. You can't leave people behind. Turn them invisible. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Theobald and Bimpkin, the two of you run away from the cloud. Are you heading somewhere in particular? We are looking for a tall building. Probably a church is likely going to be the tallest building in the immediate vicinity so that we can climb up and get a better vantage point of the cloud. Uh, sure, there's a tall building nearby. Bimpkin will scramble up on top of Theobolt, like a backpack. Just like Yoda and Luke Skywalker in The Empire Strikes Back. Yep. There's the reference I was looking for. Uh, All right, so you scramble up on on Theobolt's back and Theobolt begins to climb the building. Make an athletics check. I rolled a 12 on my athletics check. Okay, I'd say that's pretty good. You managed to climb your way up uh, to a high enough vantage point You look towards the cloud just as that second explosion occurs and you see more rubble being thrown out with a big boom, more dust being sprayed everywhere, as well as a few high-pitched screams. A couple moments later, you hear somebody yelling, my hands, my hands. Okay, so that's what we're hearing. (laughs) But uh, how does the vantage point change for us then now that we're higher up? Like, can we see sort of like where the cloud is emanating from, or sort of like a sense of direction, like are more towns guards rushing to the scene? Yes, you see lots of town guards rushing in. You see that the cloud appears to be emanating from a building that is partially collapsed. Looks like the roof is caved in, maybe. 
or been pulled in or broken in or something. Um, you're not sure if something has impacted it. You, you probably have to get a closer look. That's predominantly what you see. I'll actually have you, Theobald, make a perception check. Actually, before I make a perception check, oh. I'm, I'm considering opening my third eye, the uh, eye of the arcane lords. Okay. So, so far it's just been decorative, but it actually has magical powers that gives me bonuses for my perception checks as well as seeking undetected. And it gives me the ability to see things that I wouldn't normally with my other two eyes. All right. Maybe tell me what it looks like when that eye activates or opens. Is there some sort of like glow? Is there a magical thing you have to do? So Theobald climbs up to the top of the building, gets up and looks back and the explosion happens and we hear people screaming about their hands. And It's an alarming scene to see so much people running and explosions don't usually happen in small towns like this. So it, it's alarming and Theobald decides to like close his eyes and almost a serene response to such a chaotic moment. And then the eyeball, which had previously just sort of like looked around and had sort of like almost like a leg, like it was a lazy eye, suddenly dials open larger than it was, as if it's coming to life. And it starts to glow sort of a soft, pulsing green. And it really starts to hum and Theobald's hair kind of looks a little anime-y when it starts to lift up. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what's happening right now. All right, so from your third eye, as it begins to glow, this pulse emanates out, and you would be able to detect magic in the area, but you detect nothing in particular. Uh, oh. You can go ahead and, and make your perception check with a plus two. Okay. Um, Bimkin's uncomfortable. He's going to climb down. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> I do not like this vibrate thing. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, in like 10 episodes, we'll get a spirit bomb. It's going to be sweet. <laughs> All right, so my perception for this is 17. Okay. You're not able to detect anything magical, but your third eye gives you that extra sense of depth and perception that is missing for the normal the normal mundane eye looker you're able to see within the cloud what looks like a very large form moving within the dust oh my god do i have like predator vision for like 30 seconds that's what it would be if there if you were detecting something magical you oh, would okay. see that glow right. but because yeah. you're not seeing anything magical all you're seeing is like you know, to the untrained eye or to the the unobservant eye, this would just be a cloud of dust. But you can tell that there's something really big moving around inside it. Yeah. And so the two smallest party members are running into the cloud. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. We should probably try and stop them. I think Bimkin was really worried that this was a poisonous cloud. And that was initially why he started booking it. <laughs> He's had some bad experiences. Can he easily tell that it's just mundane dirt? floating around and that it's not like an actual noxious cloud or something. Yeah, like it doesn't have any weird color or anything to it. Okay. It's just a residue from an explosion. Yep. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I uh, overreacted a little. Uh, no, I'm, I'm pretty. We, we go back down now. Maybe we could get closer uh, across rooftops, maybe? How do you like being high up? It is okay. Not my favorite. I, I will be your backpack. That, that <laughs> work good. All right. Let's montage this and jump across rooftops. The buildings here are tight enough that you're able to scrabble and scrape your way across and a couple short hops. You are overlooking the intersection. You're uh, on the building that is just east across the street from the building. And you can see right below you, Willen and Nibnub have just turned to face the building again after having their conversation with the invisible guy. And you hear some screams coming from within the building. And then, Bimkin, you get a really strong whiff of the formaldehyde bad B.O. smell. And you kind of are <laughs> sniffing around, and you're actually smelling it from behind you. Bimkin kind of freezes when he realizes where the smell is coming from. And then he does the really slow turn around to see what's behind him. Make a perception check. 22. Bimkin, you follow your nose for a moment 
to the other ledge overlooking the other side of the building, and you can see that there are some shingles that have broken off at the top of the roof. And you see right at the base of the, the alley of the next street over, the manhole cover is just wobbling into place and then clunk, clunks down. He'll yell out to Tom, Tom, the wolf man, and he'll take off after towards the uh, manhole cover. <laughs> All right, so Bimkin begins uh, sliding down to street level on the other side of the building. Theobald, anything? I can see Willen and Nibnub. Yep, they're about 20 feet below you. I do like that whistle thing with your fingers, but I don't need the fingers because I have tusks in my mouth. So I just sort of like high-pitched whistle at them. And then I just nod in another direction. So I'm like, this is the direction we want to go in. And then I uh, I follow Bimkin. All right, so uh, Nibnub and Willen, you, you hear this noise from up above. You see Theo gesture in a direction opposite, totally away from the building that is collapsing. And you see him disappear around the edge. What do you do? Hmm. Oh, man, do you think he found, like, something delicious? No. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to go anyway. All right. I guess I'll go, too. I was going to go into that collapsing building. Seemed kind of cool, but... Well, uh, maybe later. All right. And we follow. All right, you guys follow around. Bim, can you hit the street level just beside the manhole cover? And you suddenly realize something you hadn't noticed before. Sitting right beside the manhole cover is a little small wooden soldier toy. Just lying on its side there. You get maybe uh, two, three seconds to look at it and kind of cock your head maybe confusedly uh, when everybody else comes up behind you. Do I recognize this toy? I mean, you've probably seen toys like this before. I will pick it up. Okay. And then hide it in my pocket. What do you got there, Bimkin? Uh, oh, I did not know you followed me so fast. Uh, I found this little wooden man. And he pulls it out of his pocket. Do you think the wolf man had that? I don't know. Do you see it? Sorry, DM. Like, do I see it in her hand? <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> oh, okay, sweet. <laughs> yes, Bimkin, I, I, I do see that in your hand. Yes, I am holding a toy. Yes, it's real. I see it. Yeah. Yes, it is real. I will put it in my pocket for safekeeping. I do not know if Wolfman dropped or maybe small child is hard to say. We investigate later. You guys called us over here to show us a toy, a, a, a wooden toy. I could have been in a collapsing building right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I smell the Wolfman and I... I, uh, when I turned around, I saw some shingles. They were broken, and then this manhole oh, yeah. cover was moving. I think he went down in there. I gotcha. Well, yeah. then what are we waiting for? Let's freaking go. Yeah, Theobald pulls the man cover <laughs> off the uh, the hole. All right, so Theo, you pull it up, and I would say that probably your alchemical nose is just kind of melting off of you at this point. You're able to get a little bit of that same whiff of, of bad BO that Bimkin has been following just as your nose kind of <laughs> dissolves off of you, running out of time. Oh, my God. It stinks. It does stink. Sorry, that might be me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you have a sewer below you. Who's going first? All right, Tom, get in. Nibnub's rushing in. I don't know if he can lift the manhole cover, but he's, he's getting in there. All right, so Nibnub uh, scrabbles down a short little ladder, Landing in maybe six inches of sludge and sewage at the bottom of the tunnel. It's really nice down here, you guys. You can see uh, that it proceeds in two different directions, east and west from where you are right now. It's a good thing I did not wear pants. Well, I have to do is wash a leg later. <laughs> oh, is, is that why you, you did that? Yes. Always prepared. Y yes, thank you. That's why I wear tearaways. <laughs> <laughs> They are very fashionable. Do you tear away your pants right when you do that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally. Are they like Velcro zipper? Or, uh... No, I literally tear them off. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> They're just perforated. Yeah, they, One they time had use. pretty worn seams, unfortunately. Oh, uh, there you yeah. go. Like gob style. You can sew them back up every time. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Willen, Bimkin, and Theo also drop into the sewer. 
the uh, you definitely got to stoop a little bit. Uh, it's pretty tight down here for someone of your massive size. You got two directions. You go east and west. Which direction was the collapsed building in conjunction from where we are? West. West. Maybe we should go east. What does your nose tell you? Bimkin. Yours specifically. Bimkin, you make a perception check? I rolled a 16. So Bimkin kind of starts sniffing around. All right. So you are smelling this scent heading to the east. Yes, the, uh, to, to the east is where I smell it. So away from the collapsed building. All right, let's go. So you begin to make your way, and you probably make it 15, 20 feet when suddenly there's a rumble behind you. You kind of peek back over your shoulder really quick, and the tunnel behind you begins to shudder and then collapse. The ceiling begins to drop bricks and boulders on top of you. Everybody make reflex saves. <laughs> Ah! Bimkin rolled a 20. Uh, Theobald rolled a 17. 23 for Willen. I got 31. Oh, oh my God. God. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> All right, nice. so a 31 is a critical success. Oh, sweet. A 17 is a fail. Theobald, you're going to take 12 points of damage. Oh. Willen and Bimkin will take half, just six points, and... Nimnub slides forward through the sludge, just like nose first to, to get away from this uh, collapsing tunnel. Nice. And comes up completely unscathed. All of you are coughing and hacking as dust and debris fills the sewer tunnel. You look back and you can see your way back is totally collapsed. And you can hear on the other side of this mound of rubble, this huge groaning <laughs> of something huge moving on the other side of the ball. I'm kind of glad we're following the wolfman. It seems more doable. That sounds really freaky. Yeah, I don't think I've ever heard anything quite like that before. But it sounded kind of familiar at the same time. All right, so you're uh, trapped in the sewer now. The, the way east is still open to you. Yeah, let's keep going because I don't want to get any smaller. All right. <laughs> you continue along. The sewer tunnel remains quite tight. The Obold continues to squeeze his way through. Eventually, you guys come to an intersection. Three different directions you could go from here, and each is covered by a wooden portcullis. Furry guy, get your nose out. Okay, so I'll go and I'll, I'll sniff around mm -hmm. all these entrances. I got a 10... Okay. The smell is beginning to get overridden a little bit by the scent of the sewer. You're not feeling super confident, but you're thinking the south passageway? Def definitely not the north passageway. There's a lot of poop, it's hard to tell, but I would say probably <laughs> south. Could Theobald quickly just do like a perception check to sort of like investigate these doors? They're like wooden portcullises, so like they kind of would keep larger pieces of debris from getting drifted through. And they all have gates on them that could allow a worker through or something like that. Oh, okay. Yep. So Theobald takes his time to sort of look over top of his friends in sort of like his squished little manner. He rolls a 26 in this perception investigating the three different portcullis, whatever they're called. Port portculi? I don't know. <laughs> You're checking around them for signs of use and signs of wear and see if they've recently been open. And you see that there are some marks on the south gate, some marks in the sludge, some splashing higher up onto the gate that make you think that probably or maybe somebody has been through this way recently. Yeah, well, definitely follow Bimkin. Bim Bimkin was right. South South Passage is the passage we want. You go to, to move the gate or to shake it open, and it appears to be wedged tight. It doesn't look like it's physically locked, but it's like jammed in place. Is there like a lever somewhere nearby? You don't see anything. It looks like maybe it's just in there too tight or maybe something wedged into place in it. Hmm. But Nibnub could totally bite it. I think that would be cool. I'm going to... Um, Nibnub is biting it. Okay. <laughs> Make an athletics check. Did you get your tetanus shot before you did this? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I got another 31. Whoa. Okay. Nibnub runs up to it with his can opener jaws and just snaps through the gate <laughs> and just like shatters into a couple pieces falling back. And it swings open easily. There you go. 
Good, good job, Nip. Wow. Nip. Another critical success from Nip. Yeah. The jaws of life. Didn't taste very good. <laughs> All right. So you guys continue through. Yeah. I'm going to have Bimkin roll another perception check with his nose. Bimkin got a 24. All right. You come to a point where there's another T intersection. You can see further along to the right here, there is a ladder going up to a grate above. And to the left, there appears to be a large cistern that opens into a larger area. You smell back and forth. And you're pretty confident they went to the right towards the ladder. He just points to the right and starts moving in that direction. Okay, you get up to this ladder and you can see that there's another grate above it or a manhole cover above you. Looks kind of heavy, but it does look like it's been moved recently. There's a little crack of light coming through. Okay, it points up to the top and looks at Tom, expecting him to open it. Theobald sort of, as he got to the T intersection and sees Vimkin scurrying up, following their nose, curiosity holds Theobald pretty tight. So how far away is that open space? Maybe 40 feet till you could get a really good view of what's out there. Okay, I'll, I'll be right there. I'll, I'll be right there, Vimkin. I just got to go poke my head over here. So Theobald scooches over to, to see what's in that big empty space. All right, you make your way over to the big empty space and you can see that as you get closer, it appears to open into a larger chamber. You have dark vision, so you're kind of able to see this fairly well in black and white. A larger cylindrical chamber, about 40 feet in diameter, and honeycombing the side walls of this thing are just more and more tunnel entrances. It's dozens if not hundreds of of ways in and out you can see that maybe about 50 feet below you the cylinder is filled with water and you can see that even there there's partially submerged tunnels holy smokes okay curiosity satisfied this place is perfect for getting around without guards stopping you so let's go back and i'll help out with that manhole cover for uh, bimkin you lift the manhole cover Pull yourself up a little ways. Look out. Theobald, you suddenly have a memory. Whoa. Everything goes black. And slowly fades in on this scrub brush and boulder dotted hills and fields. They're all painted blue by the moonlight. You see two dark shapes moving through the rough cut land, leading a donkey and a cart. The side of the cart is painted in bright garish lettering, in two different languages. In common, it says, Oliver Fleecher's restorative cure-alls and tinctures. And below that, in Orkish, it says, Medicines and alcohols, transported with permission from Grask Oldeth. And then a little icon, like a skull gripped in a hand. The pair crest arise, silhouetted against the night sky, and they look down into the next valley. The smaller figure with a wide belly and a wild mustache looks down into the valley with a grim look etched into his hard human features. The other figure is silent, tall and hulking. He's covered head to toe with rags which are ratty and torn. Seedwallow is up ahead, the man speaks, although you can usually see the light of the inn or hear sounds from the tavern. We can't be that late. Couldn't have lost that much time when I stopped to pick you up. He trails off and the two begin to descend the path, carefully guiding the old donkey and the cart around ruts and large rocks, consumed by a cautious silence. I lived here for a few years, started the tavern where I brew my tinctures. My wife tends the regulars mostly, uh, farmers and fishermen and so. Every once in a while, maybe even a merchant will come through. The town is small and acts mostly as a place for trade, so the raiding orcs generally leave us alone. He pauses for a moment. Uh, are you from a raiding tribe? But there's no response from the tall, ragged figure. They reach the village, and Oliver looks in in shocked amazement and grief. He looks through doorways and windows and pauses at garden plots. There are bodies everywhere. Townsfolk lie around, strewn like dolls thrown in the midst of a tantrum. The buildings are black from fire, many of them nothing more than wooden skeletons. 
Oliver leads them through to one of the central buildings. Like the rest, the building is black and falling apart. Its timbers are burned as well. He rests his hands on the ashy studs that once held the door, looking inside to what remains of the raised tavern. Oliver's taller companion stands in the middle of the road, slowly drinking in the scene. The tall figure stoops over a body lying across a fence. A green hand emerges from his ragged robes and gently touches the dead person's wounds. A large bruise on the back of the chest, cracked to the skull, dried blood pooling from the ears. I had a son too, we see tears on Oliver's cheeks in the moonlight. He hides his face from his companion. He was a lost soul. I don't think he belonged in Belkson. I wish I'd gotten him away from here. One of life's big regrets. The two set up a small camp, each rolling out a bedroll in a spot beside the old chapel, concealed from the wind and from eyes that might spot them from the ridge. They dare not light a fire. Oliver finally looks over to the other man, both sitting quietly in the dark. Were you a raider? Like the ones that did this? No. That was not my path. I had... was to have other responsibilities. Besides, it was not orcs that did this. It was... Oliver stares back into the fire. I know what to call you now. You've been looking for a way out of this land, and now I see there's nothing left for me here. We can both get out of here together, and I'll call you after my son. May the gods rest his soul. It's Theobald. The orc grunts and pulls back the rags covering his face, his clear, unblemished face, younger than we've seen before and without tattoos and without the unnerving third eye. It's as good as any, better than what I had. You said that this wasn't orcs. No. The wolf took them. Oliver stares in confusion. Must have been some wolf. And Theobald, as you raise the manhole cover off of the street, you look out and you see the alley that leads to the seven-ton mattock. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> wow. What do you do? I, I get out onto the street to... um make way for the others, my other companions. As everybody comes up, you see the alley in front of you. Right there, there's the seven-ton mattock. You can see the sign. You see the posters of Tom and the boys. And Bimkin, you still smell that smell. He's close. You know, I feel like this is the way that the one that we are pursuing is telling us that they know who we are by leading us to where we are staying. No, Wolf is not as smart. He probably, you know, this is home. He come here often. I hope you're right. But uh, I have a bad feeling about this. Well, let's kick in some doves. Let's find this wolf so I can bite it. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to bite it, but... All right, let's uh, keep going. So you guys move up to the uh, the front door of the seven-ton mattock. Who opens it? Uh, let me just make a quick perception check, see if I hear anything inside. Sure. Well, inside he was going to kick some doors in, so I think he should try to kick it down. Well, yeah. give me a second, and then I'll, <laughs> then I'll kick it in. Uh, Do it right now! Will, and are you going to start stretching? Like, mm, yeah, like you should kick. stretch first. <laughs> <laughs> I roll a 20 on my perception. Will, and you put your ear up to the door really quick, and you hear sort of muffled can't tell if it's talking, moaning, or groaning coming from the other side. Just too muffled. All right, boys. Let's kick in some doors. <laughs> <laughs> and then I attempt to kick in the door. Athletics check. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> and there we go. We got a seven. <laughs> All right, so Willen lifts his boot and kicks about as high as he can on the door. His uh, kick just bounces back and you're immediately able to tell the way that that door held fast, even against that, the gnome's kick, you think it's barricaded. Interesting. Hmm. What does the front of the tavern look like? Is it like a door with some windows? There's kind of like a deck patio thing in the front? No, you want to think like speakeasy in an alley. 
Oh, okay. So it's just an it's just a door. Just a door. Little sign above the door that, with a picture of a pickaxe on it. Posters of you guys all around. You can see that up above, maybe 10, 15 feet above you, are windows that would lead to the, the rooms that you guys were staying in. But uh, this is your, your main entrance is just this door. Around the corner would be the entrance to the side or back of the kitchen? Yeah, you might be able to get into the kitchen that way. Guys, what do you think about going around back? I don't know. I felt this door giving a little. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just want to smash stuff. All right. Uh, let's smash through some stuff through the kitchen. Because okay. if this door is barricaded, that means they are stuck on the inside. Right? So let's pin them against this door. All right. It was very good kick. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. So you guys rush around the side of the building. You can see uh, in the adjacent alley, there is another door. You're pretty sure this is the kitchen door. Who opens it? Theobald looks at Willen and gestures to be like, like, let's kick this door down. I've, I've had my fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Theobald <laughs> attempts to just open the door. Okay. Theobald, you turn the doorknob. Genius. And you <laughs> push. And the door swings open. Well, look who else is a wizard. <laughs> <laughs> you find yourself looking into the kitchen. There's a pot of soup boiling above the fire. There's kitchen implements laid out. You see the door that leads into the front area or the, ta- the common area of the tavern. And hanging in the open doorway is Sarah hanging from a rope. <gasps> What part of her body is she hanging from? <laughs> By her neck. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh. That's not ideal. I really hope she's just doing pull-ups. Oh, no. Sarah, she gave me food. But I'm going to need everybody to roll me initiative. Oh, oh. Willen got 30. And Nibna, what was yours? Nibna got 21. Bimkin got 28. And Theobald. Theobald got 24. All righty, so we are looking at a life or death situation here. Sarah hangs by her neck from the door jam of her own little tavern. Mm-hmm. Willen, what do you do? All right, I look at the top of the rope, and uh, how thick would you say the rope is? Maybe half an inch. Okay. Do you think an acid splash would eat right through that? It would. Or could I mage hand it and untie it? That's more complex. That would take multiple actions to do. Okay. But you could do that. All right. I think I'll just try damaging it with the acid splash then. Okay. It seems a quicker route. Nib-nub ducks. (laughs) Seems to get out the acid. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Sarah, duck. (laughs) Well, I'm casting at the rope above her head. But I guess acid drips. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It does does say splash in the name. Hmm. (laughs) She's fine. (laughs) Or... Could I summon a construct up top there and have it, like, attack the rope? Yeah, let's look at what kind of constructs you can summon. I have them at level one, my constructs. Or I can cast it as a level one spell. Okay, so yeah, summon construct is a three action activity, but then it immediately enters initiative and gets to take two actions on its turn. So you're casting it as a first level spell. That would be good, actually, because then the construct could help Sarah while we deal with Whoever put her up there, presumably, might still be here. Although, Foundry does this really sweet zoom-in, and now I see that there's some cheese knives <laughs> over on this kitchen table. <laughs> oh, yeah, Could there you be go. utilized. <laughs> the first level summon construct creatures list you gave me has two creatures in it. Yeah. One is an animated broom. Sure. It seems pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and the other is a lesser guardian statue. So what do you want to do? I'm leaning towards broom. We can always homebrew that, too. <laughs> you could change the broom to animated knife, and it would do slashing instead of bludgeoning. Oh, that'd be interesting. Just a floating knife? Yeah. What if, narratively, Willen used the cheese knives from the counter and, like, spun them up? Is, is that yeah. technically the same thing, or is it... I feel like that's basically what he's doing. He's animating an object in the room. Mm-hmm. Cool. All right, so you summon you summon <laughs> an animated knife. Yeah. The same size as Sarah? Uh, so that's your three actions. <laughs> oh, <laughs> my God. Same, it's huge. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've never done this before. <laughs> so now 
you're going to act for that. You have the stat block there. You're going to act for that knife. So I'll okay. move it around. You'll tell me where you want it, etc. Okay. So I'm going to have it go up above on the rafters or whatever she's tied to. And uh, just try to cut it from there. Okay. Make an attack roll. Rolled an 18 plus 6. Okay, so we got 24. And do your damage. 1d4 slashing. Nice, max. 4 damage. All right, so the knife jumps up off the table, flies across the room, slices through or like stabs into the rafter, slicing the rope. Sarah's body crumples to the ground, uh, unconscious and lifeless, it looks like. And you hear some movement in the common room of the tavern. Bimkin, it's your turn. Bimkin will rush over to Sarah and cast Stabilize. Oh, okay. Tell me about this spell. So positive energy uh, shuts death's door. The target loses the dying condition, though it remains unconscious and at zero hit points. So he'll kind of just come over slowly kneel beside her, close his eyes, and then just wave his hands above her. Your cloak kind of ruffles in, in an invisible wind, and she begins to breathe as the rope loosens its grasp on her neck. How many actions was that? That is two. Okay. Theobald, what do you do? Sarah's just regained consciousness. She's unconscious, but not dying. All right. Theobald also follows Bimkin's lead, and sort of rushes to Sarah's side, Theobald has battle medicine. So he's able to tend to the wounds of people on the fly. It's something that he picked up from working in a bar. All right. Go ahead and roll a medicine check to treat wounds. Theobald tends with a 23 to Sarah's wounds. Nice. Okay, so you successfully treat wounds. You're going to restore 2d8 hit points. Sarah. Sarah gets 14 hit points back. Theobald, you drop to your knees. You uh, reach over her. You pull the noose off. You check her neck for contusions or breaks. You see nothing important going on there, so you make sure that she's breathing, feeling pretty good about it, and you maybe you administer uh, a little bit of a concoction that you have on your belt, and she <coughs> begins to regain consciousness. Nibna, it is your turn. All right, so Nibnub is going to... He's happy that Sarah's back alive, but he's going to just kind of rush past her mm-hmm. and head out the door. What do I see? You see from the door frame two men standing in the common room of the tavern. One over by the fireplace is pressed flat up against the wall, You see that his shirt hangs and tatters off of him and this like huge bloody mark on his chest looks like a strip of skin has been ripped off of his stomach in a spiral shape. On the other side of the room, on the other side of the bar, next to another set of tables, is another man. This one, his clothes are mostly intact, wearing ragged commoner clothing, but you can see that uh, a spiral is also carved, but into his face. Like, and his skin's hanging off? The strip of skin is missing, but it's like half inch wide, just strip has been removed from the side of his face across one cheek over the eye. Oh, God. It's kind of like scarification, right? Like he's been carved out? Like intentionally. Gross. Yeah, looks very intentional. Both of them have this wide-eyed, manic look about them. They see you come through the door and they just... And we'll see you in two weeks. Thanks again for listening to The House on Carrion Hill. If you want to support the show, there's a few ways you can do that. You can give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. You can find us on social media and find us at The House of Bob on Twitter, Instagram, probably some other things. Join us on the Discord where you can chat with us and other listeners about what's going on in the show, what's going on in life. The Food and Drinks channel is hot lately. (laughs) (laughs) Artwork this week is, of course, by Sean Makes because uh, I did that. Editing for this episode is by Alex of Astronomic Audio and music for the show. He's being produced by Mike from Tales of the Glass Garden World podcast. Thank you, Mike. You're amazing. We'd also like to thank all of our patrons. We could not do this without you. Connor, Pedrick, Brandon, Ron, T. Maiman, Pavel, Christine, Tom, Elias, Mark, Mary, Jessica, Ray, Scooter, Tyler, Josh, Keith, Bucket12, Tom, Jessica, 
That's in second Jessica. You heard me right. Kieran, Mike, Luke, and Volt. Thank you all for your support. Have a good week. Man, that channel really is popping. Mm -hmm. I had it muted, so. Me too. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had to mute it when there was too much pickle talk, but I unmuted it to ask pickle questions. So I'm really a huge hypocrite. <laughs> it's really popular, but we're not listening. <laughs> <laughs> it's like three of us. <laughs> Willen, did you like make a, a building be alive with your magic? Yes, not today, though. Oh, okay. Because, well, maybe your Franken building is killing people. I don't know. Now I got to put that into Willen's flashback notes. <laughs> <laughs> when I brought a building to life. Yeah. <laughs> Willen, the building mancer. <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> I'm an abomination. <laughs> I'm a monster. <laughs> Kill me. <laughs> it's just stomping around. Stay home. <laughs> <laughs> like swallowing people at the door. <laughs> oh my god. All right. It's all this is all too good. I can't can't write it all down. Okay. <laughs> That's the one character I remembered her name. I can't even remember your guys' names. <laughs> I keep confusing Theo and Tom. <laughs> no, I mean they're the same name. One's a nickname, so it's good. Sarah with a C? Give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly Willen just like turns around and walks yeah. out of the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> Is she worth <laughs> saving? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Her parents aren't, that's for sure. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Yikes. It does kind of sound like an antidepressant brand or something. <laughs> yeah, ask your doctor about Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is terrible. We're just terrible people. <laughs>